Oh boy. Do we have an exciting machine for this episode? And the last one, Sega manufactured ending its stake in the console wars. Releasing in 1999 via the US, this thing could be had for a competitive price of a couple hundred bucks. Fast forward two short years, and Sega was already slashing prices repeatedly, going as low as $50 before it was all said and done. After several years of losses and the hundreds of millions of dollars, and the absolute battering Sony delivered to Sega's market share, the company threw in the towel and settled on building software for its former competitors instead. In this video, we're going to see how many of these six Dreamcasts we can fix and see what caused them to fail. Now for continuity's sake, we're going to keep track of these Dreamcasts numerically like this. Interestingly enough, it looks like someone has already diagnosed them. But we'll be the judge of that. And I guess they didn't get around to this one. Not to worry though. We're going to double check these consoles anyway. Before we get to work on these consoles, let's go pro with our diagnostics and employ the use of Sega's first handheld. Besides the fact that the system's battery is dead, it boots into the console's dashboard just fine. This game is the sole reason to get a Dreamcast. I sunk so many quarters into this thing back when arcades were popular at the mall. And nothing. Well, it's obvious there is something wrong with this ROM drive, but is it the spinning motor or the optical reader? To find out, I simply closed the ROM lid for a second and then promptly opened it up to catch if the disc was spinning. In this case, we could tell that the optical reader is the problem. Now these optical readers are over 20 years old, and they oxidize just like anything else. Let's use this Headlight Restore product to see if hazing is the issue. Also, you don't have to use this brand of product for this application. I'd be confident using any reputable Headlight Restore. And boom. It looks like we got this Dreamcast working again. After doing some quick preliminary tests, we're ready to check out Dreamcast number two. And it looks like this Dreamcast's only issue is a dead system battery. Namco. After doing some basic tests, it's time to move on to Dreamcast number three. And this Dreamcast is just like our last one. Everything works except for the system battery. Namco. Let's go ahead and move on to Dreamcast number four. Namco. Okay, this is gonna be a super short video if this keeps up. This Dreamcast doesn't exhibit any controller or disc read issues, but like all the other consoles, the system's battery doesn't work. While well, the system's battery for this fifth Dreamcast is dead like all the others, it appears that the optical laser for this ROM doesn't read. And try as I might, the headlight restore trick didn't work. For this console, I opted to replace the ROM drive with one I found online. But at these prices and the failure rate of these units, it makes more sense to forgo using these drives entirely. These GD ROMs are legacy units anyway, and it's only a matter of time before they fail again. It would make more financial sense to use an optical simulation board such as a GD Emu. And just like that, our Dreamcast is playing games again. Namco. Let's see what our last console has in store for us. Yep, and you guessed it, another dead system battery. Just something to be aware of if you plan on purchasing this console. While I was attempting to restore the lens of the drive unit, I found something peculiar going on. What is going on with that ribbon cable? I have no idea how this could have happened. I'm curious what you guys can make of this. If you have any ideas of what happened, go ahead and leave it down in the comments below. Being that the last Dreamcast ROM drive was faulty, swapping over its ribbon cable to this one didn't remedy this situation either. Let's hold off fixing this Dreamcast for now, and pimp it out for the next video. For me personally, it's not enough just to have these units working. Let's go the extra mile and really restore one of these Dreamcasts back to its former glory. Plus, I wouldn't be proud of letting any of these go in their current state. This console is pretty simple to take apart. All we need to do is keep the screws in their respective slots when setting them aside. 
For this power supply, it's safer to keep the plastic shroud on when handling it. These capacitors can give quite a jolt, so it's better not even to mess with them. The reason this system is yellowed so much is because the flame retardants in the plastic have been bombarded with UV light. You can tell it isn't heat because the internal plastic remains its original color. Before we get to the cosmetics of this console, let's give it the maintenance that they all deserve. Now these system batteries use an ML-based 2032 rechargeable wafer. These should not be confused with the CR-based 2032s like the old BIOS batteries. Another issue that Dreamcast had was that if you unplugged the controller while the system was on, it could potentially blow a fuse. I personally remember this fuse placement by thinking of the F1 key on a keyboard. Fortunately, there are third-party battery holders for this Dreamcast, so we won't ever have to do the solder job again. As far as this console's dead controller issue goes, we can use this resettable fuse component so that if we ever do encounter a dead controller, simply powering off this unit will restore its function again. Now let's fix the cosmetics of this particular console. After throwing all these parts in the dishwasher for sanitation purposes, it's time to renew this case to the same color it was when it was sold before the millennia. Now there are several products that can achieve this, but for simplicity purposes, I use this hair bleach I got from a local beauty store. Any hair bleach that uses hydrogen peroxide will accomplish the same thing. Just make sure hydrogen peroxide is the active ingredient. These Ziploc bags are used to trap the moisture of the peroxide gel so it doesn't solidify and stop working for us. And because we're using a gel instead of pure peroxide, we'll be painting this product onto it. This stuff is so potent it'll work on overcast days as well. Even rainy days emit UV light. Once everything is painted, bagged, and sealed, let's give it a few days to work its magic. Three days later. After washing this product off with soapy water, we could see some markings littering this poor Dreamcast. Now, I don't know the region you're watching from, but I swear this product is every bit as magic as the label claims. Not only can it remove these marks, but it can also remove permanent marker name labels from plastic. After putting everything back together, this unit looks and feels amazing. This is a night and day difference before we had it. Namco. And that about does it for this video. While these examples are anecdotal, I have zero faith in these ROM drives. If you like this video, or if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and leave them down below. And as always, I'll see you next time. Oh, shit. me. Smart. Real smart there, buddy. Where the hell did it go? <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Some of those. <laughs> All right.